Hello. <laughs> Welcome to the green space. If you can hear me talking and you're in the lobby, come into the studio, because it's showtime. How many of you are in the green space for the first time? <laughs> nice. Oh, and you're wooing about it already. <laughs> you haven't even done that much to earn that woo. We're going to do so much more. Thank you for coming out. Um, if you're listening or watching at home, just stay where you are. You're ready for the show. Um, we are broadcasting this online, so if you want to check it out later, share it with a friend, share it with a foe, um, whatever you want to do, share it. That would be great. Um, before we get started with this part of tonight, if you would, silence your phones. If you haven't done that already, you can turn them back on later. But for now, while we're up on stage, are any of you members of WNYC or WQXR? Very nice. There's a table in the lobby if you want to remedy that. Everyone else, thank you so much to our members. Everything that we do is supported by you and the Jerome L. Green Foundation. So the green space is WNYC's space for communal experiments and experiences. We make radio, we make podcasts, and we do it all with you here. If you're a fan of WNYC, you probably love Brian Lehrer, as you should. He does a live broadcast here every month, um, and they always sell out. There's one next week. I don't know if there's tickets left, but if you want to check that out, that's great. We do a lot of classical music here with WQXR, and we do podcasts. Whoa. <laughs> yeah, hey, QXR fan, you gotta, you gotta shout it out. Um, and we also do a lot of podcasts. Next week we have a podcast festival, um, all podcasts hosted by women, that's going on here in the green space and at venues all around town. We have Code Switch, you know that show from NPR? They're gonna be at the Apollo as part of our festival. We have our own show, Nancy, out at the Bell House in Brooklyn. We have On Being, hosted by Krista Tippett, happening uptown at Hunter College. Yeah, it's um, a lot of great shows, and three here in the green space. So if you wanna check that out, you can find links to that on our website as well. So I hope you'll come back. But all of that is later. We call tonight's event a night of civic inspiration, music, and drinks. We hope we're gonna get all three in your brains and in your hands. Um, you've already been mingling and meeting your neighbors and some of the people and community organizations that are working to make our city stronger, safer, and more equitable for all New Yorkers. There's gonna be more time for mingling and drinks later, as well as a gorgeous musical performance. But before all that, we do have information and inspiration we're gonna bring to the stage for you. And to get that going, I'm gonna hand the mic over to your co-host for this evening, WNYC's Yasmin Khan and Shemita Basu. Abby. Hello, welcome. I'm Yasmin Khan. And I'm Shamita Basu. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Um, this is a really intense moment in our country. Take a deep breath. So thank you for being here with us. Um, you know, part of the point of tonight is that there's really a lot more that you can be in control of maybe than you think. That's what our reporting has focused on for the past couple of months is um, how how into it are you civically? How can we help you um, be more civically engaged? So that's what we've been doing, and that's what tonight is all about, Beyond the Vote. But before we get to that, we just want to take the temperature in this room. So raise your hand, just a couple of questions. How many of you have done something new in the past year to be more civically engaged or somehow affect change in your community? Hands up if that's you. A lot of people for the first time in the past year. Yeah, I like the clapping, yes. Good for you, that's great. How many people here will be voting for the very first time tomorrow? Anyone in this room? I don't see any hands raised. Tell me if I'm missing anyone. Okay, we have a lot of voters in this room, got it. How many people here encourage someone and convince someone to show up and vote tomorrow for the first time? Nice yes. work. Yes, great work. Okay, we're gonna carry that with us for the rest of the evening. Good to know who's in the room. I'm gonna exit the stage so that Yasmin can get on with um, the next portion of the evening. Yes. Be back. So we later. have like a whole program going here. Thank you, Shemita. Oh, thank you. Um, so you all may not realize that, there, that uh, the city just hired someone actually to help you all be more civically engaged. Um, Irene Fonseca Sabuni is the city's first chief democracy officer, <laughs> which is a pretty fancy title. She works in the mayor's office and she's here. So you can come on up and join me. She's going to help us understand what her job is and how you can all bother her and keep tabs. Um, so first, thank you. I want you to just go ahead and describe your role. What is your job? Yes. Exactly. Good question. Uh, Chief Democracy Officer. When I got that job, 
my parents called me and they were like, what? What's your job? What, what is, is that? that? And, um, and someone said to me, oh, you're a chief. That means you have power. And I said, no, that means it's my job to make sure every New Yorker has power and every New Yorker has a voice in their city and in their government. So the best description that I've had, um, I've been going out, a big part of my job is youth engagement, is getting young people engaged and excited about participating in their city in, in, through voting or th through other ways. And so I've had the chance to go to high schools all over the city. And with uh, the high school students, I break it down, I put it on the board, chief democracy officer. And I ask them, what do these words mean? And it's just been great to hear from them what each of the pieces mean. And they've said, well, a chief is a leader, and um, an officer is someone who pr provides protection for the people. And I love that. democracy is about voting and about people's voice. And so that's my job, to provide protection for the people, for people's voice, for people's voices, and, and to be a leader in doing that. So, so that's why I'm here, that's what I'm excited about, and I'm so thrilled to see all the folks in this room tonight um, who are here to begin thinking about this more. And you know, concretely, uh, there are a few different pieces to the position. Um, there's voter registration, that's huge. Making it easier to vote in New York State. There is no reason we shouldn't have early voting in this state. There's no reason we shouldn't have same day voter registration. We shouldn't have automatic voter registration. Early pre-registration for 16 and 17 year olds. So there's a lot we can do. New York State is behind so many other states, dozens of other states, and it should not be that way. So, um, so we have a lot of work to do. So protecting democracy is your job. No pressure. Yeah, it's pretty easy. Um, <laughs> you know, gonna go take a nap. And so what are the ways, because all these um, groups are here tonight also because they're gonna help people be involved. How are, what are the ways that people can be involved with your office specifically? Sure. Or, and, and also to sort of stay in the know about yes, what you're doing. Absolutely. So what I would love it if people can do, I have a colleague here tonight, um, George Van Hool, and he'll be in the, in the very front um, when you enter by the bar. That's a good, good way to remember. And um, you can sign up right there with him um, on the iPad for our Democracy NYC mailing list. And on that, on our website, um, nyc.gov slash democracy nyc. Um, there are different ways to, that you would, you know, you can say, I would like to get engaged. I'm interested in census. Census is a part of our job, making sure that every New Yorker is counted so that we are properly represented at the federal level, um, both for funding and for actual representation in Congress. Um, so if you want to get involved in that, if you want to get involved in voter registration, if you want to get involved in youth registration. So I would say sign up there, and then we will be in touch with you and be letting you know different ways. It's going to change over time. This is not a static process. Democracy is not static, so we're going to be changing over time, but at least through that way we can be um, in touch with you um, as the, the needs and the message evolves. Okay, so you can find, uh, not Jorge, George, he goes by George, um, and the purple tie, I think. Yes, he, here he is. Uh, oh, there he is. Yes. Um, so there are organizations doing this work already. Yes. Um, there are also parts of city government that are doing this work. Um, getting people involved in service and volunteering and that kind of thing. So why does the city need a chief democracy officer? Why does there need to be another part of government doing this? Yes, um, that's a good question. And it's because we need to do it better. We need, in New York City, we have 23% voter participation and that's in a good election in the primary. That was, that was awesome. Really yeah, that was a great turnout. Um, you know, for the general, we're hovering, you know, around 25%. We can do better. We know that we can do better. We know that in this great city, people want to participate. This is a great moment in the history of our country and our state and our city. Um, people are excited and we need to plug into that. We don't want people to say, oh, I'm excited, but I don't know what to do. We want people to say, I'm excited and I know how to plug in. So I think um, my role is to help coordinate and collaborate with all those groups. I can say since I started a month ago, I've been on the phone with the good government groups, with the different um, parts of city government uh, on a na nearly daily basis, talking and figuring out how to coordinate and work better together. Tomorrow, we will be coordinating with all these folks. So um, anybody who tells me we don't have work to do, I don't know where they are, but here in New York City, there's a lot of work to do, and the chief democracy role is just to make sure we're all working together and we're making it easier to participate in New York City. And I know you, you have been out talking to people when you've been registering them to vote or just sort of talking to people about engagement. I'm just wondering what you've heard from them and if they're 
you said that you notice a lot of energy. If they're yes. high energy, if they're optimistic, if they're frustrated. Yes. What have you heard? Um, it runs the gamut, and I think it, uh, it depends where you are and what, what we're talking about. But it's been interesting. I mean, it's been the, the best thing about this job so far has been uh, talking with folks all over um, New York City in, in, in all of the boroughs and hearing from people. And I'd say it's been surprising. Like, I've been at a lot of senior centers and, um, and uh, faith communities, and a lot of people say, well, those people vote. Why do you need to go there? And what's been interesting is going there at the senior centers, um, senior citizens are saying, actually, this is really challenging, and I do it, but it's so hard, and why can't we have no excuse absentee voting so I can vote by mail um, and not have to worry about, you know, if I have a medical issue or so getting out to the polls. it's hard for them to get yes, to the polls. Yes, yes, and they're doing it, but we should make it easier. Um, hearing from um, working parents with young kids, and that's something I can certainly relate to, um, dealing with nighttime events or middle-of-the-day events. You know, we are not a one-size-fits-all city. We're an incredibly diverse city, and, you know, there are 8.6 million of us. There should be 8.6 million different ways to participate in our city. So I've been hearing people who are just kind of like, I want to do something, but I don't know what, and I don't know how. And so I think the democracy initiative is to really provide that information to help people get connected and figure out how they can get more involved. And I, you know, one of the things that we've been hearing a lot too is just people at a minimum want to stay in the know about what's going on. They at least want to know when all the meetings are happening and what all the meetings are. And so being able to sort of streamline that or use technology or something like that, if there's an app that people could sign up for to know when all of these community board meetings are or something like that, that would be awesome. That would be awesome. And FYI, you know, <laughs> how much time do we spend looking at our phones? And can we spend some of that time looking at our phones being civically engaged? That would be great. So what do you say to the person who feels cynical, maybe, and yeah. who feels discouraged? Yeah, I hear from those people. And I'll say, when I talk with the, uh, the teenagers, they also run the gamut. And some are excited. And some are like, it doesn't even matter. And I know my vote doesn't matter. And they may have um, you know, seen the popular vote. and federal elections where they feel it wasn't fair. And what I really try to do is connect with them on an issue that they care about and say, well, what do you care about? What matters to you? And then how can you impact that? And it might be something small. It might be picking up litter, like there's too much litter on my street. How can we you know, connect about that on a local issue and letting them know, actually, in local elections, your vote matters a ton. Your vote, each and every vote matters. So I think. Um, connecting p with people on that level, both on what they care about and letting them know that for local issues, many of which they do care about, you know, their voice does matter. Well, thank you so much thank you. for enlightening us and introducing, you know, yourself to everybody. Um, if, again, if you have questions or if you want to get involved with Democracy NYC, is the name of your office? Yes. Okay. Democracy NYC. Then you can see George. <laughs> so thank you so much, Rini. Thank you so much, Jessie. Thank it. you all. Thank you. And now you're going to hear from all these wonderful groups that have come here tonight to share some wisdom with us and some expertise. Uh, Shamita's going to take that part. Thank you. Okay, so we have a fun little way that this is going to work. Um, it's going to be a little bit like a dating roulette show, except there's no dating and um, there's no single rows. I'm mixing my dating shows now. But we're gonna do this really rapid fire and just give three minutes to each of these groups. Some of the groups do have tables around the room and some of them just have several representatives from their organizations floating around, ready to mingle with you afterward. So we have three minutes on the clock. My editor and producer Ryan over there will be signaling to me when there's a minute left, at which case I will politely kick you off stage and say, let's bring on the next person. So let's start with the first person from the Community Service Society of New York, Jeffrey Macklin. Come on up, Jeffrey. Thank you. The timer's already begun, so let's go. Okay. I understand that your group does work in a whole variety of areas, a whole variety of issues, but just give us the 30-second overview of what CSS does. Okay, that's hard to do, but I'll try. So uh, CSS is Here, a... Here, hold your mic up, a, like, CS yeah, just like me. Is this? That's okay. perfect. CSS is a long-time anti-poverty organization. Uh, we've been around for over 175 years. What we do is uh, we address root causes of economic disparity, and we do that through uh, applied science, through advocacy, through litigation, and through innovative program services. And um, we do that on behalf of uh, New York City's uh, low-income New Yorkers. It's about three million of them. 
And um, so that's kind of the elevator speech. That's uh, perfect. Speech. That's um, all we have time for. No, no. Yeah. I have I one like more add, question for you. I would like to add one quick oh, go, thing. Go ahead. That, go ahead. Um, uh, recently, we achieved half price fares uh, for low-income New Yorkers uh, <laughs> working, working in coalition with a lot of other advocacy groups uh, that saw that access and affordability of our transit system was a real hardship for a lot of low-income New Yorkers and giving them access to the public transit system means that they can uh, access economic opportunities, education op educational opportunities, and really take advantage of what you know we love about this city. So um, that's a recent achievement that uh, we work with a lot of people on and it goes into effect in January. Excellent. Jeffrey, I know that you want to tell people tonight about one particular program called RSVP that right. <coughs> if you're listening, you might be interested in, in volunteering for. Right, right. right. Uh, RSVP is our retired and senior volunteer program. And uh, it started in 1966 in Staten Island. And since then, it's expanded throughout the country and throughout the five boroughs. Um, essentially, what the program does is we harness the talents and uh, expertise and knowledge of our older adults in New York City. And um, we uh, deploy them throughout the city uh, at um, nonprofit organizations and other agencies where they can put their skills to work um, uh, helping others and basically uh, filling gaps in programs that have lost money because government programs have been scaled back or eliminated altogether. Is there uh, a particular skill set that you're looking for for volunteers, or is it anyone can, can basically volunteer? Their anybody time? 55 and old, o older can, can okay. volunteer for the program, but many of our seniors um, already you know, uh, had successful uh, careers, they retired, and they wanted to, you know, they got bored. They wanted to do something mm -hmm. to give back and, and be active and involved in, in their community. So the program is um, really fantastic. Uh, can I put can a plug people, in? Yes, please. How can people uh, find out how to so, sign up? So um, on our website, um, you can click uh, RSVP mobilization and get information on, on volunteering, signing up. Um, our, our website is www.cssny.org. And, um, you know, one thing I will say about the program that, that's really special is that um, not only is it helping, um, uh, you know, communities, um, our volunteers mentor children of incarcerated parents, they work in soup kitchens, they work, uh, they deliver meals to homebound seniors, they work in hospitals, they work with veterans, they work with people with disabilities. Um, uh, they, they help people with financial literacy. They do a range of things, but the real unique thing is that um, research shows that seniors who are actively engaged in social and civic efforts, um, they show improvement in their mental and physical health. So the, the program gives back, you know, the seniors can give back to their communities, but they also get something out of it. Mm. And if that can, you know, uh, uh, prolong somebody's independence or cut, uh, reduce um, uh, uh, social costs, um, that, that's great. But um, the program really is, is unique and um, we have a lot of volunteers about, uh, I don't know, about 2,200 citywide. And um, uh, you know, we just encourage people to give it a, sh give it a look and, and get involved. Jeffrey, Jeffrey Macklin. Thank you so much. Find Jeffrey thank after you. if you want to know you. more about CSS. Thank you. Next up on the stage, DC Vito from 22 by 20. DC, where are you? Oh, you're up here. I'm going to stand over here then. Oh, you're going to have a mic very soon. DC, tell us about, I'm saying it right, right? This is 22 by 20. 22 by 20, yes. And this is a reference to the fact that there are 22 million teenagers who will be of voting age by 2020. Is that right? Correct. Largest voting bloc ever. Tell us more. What does your group do? So we are connecting those 22 million new voters mm -hmm. to participate now and not wait till 2020. So we're asking them to be civically engaged now. We have fellows across the country, 10 fellows, where they are creating media about issues that they, met, they care about, so they're about their community. And about. these are teenagers, the these fellows are, are teenagers. These are 13 to 17, okay. yes. And what kinds of issues are they, are they creating? So the four issues that they're most concerned about are education, not a surprise, job and, jobs and opportunities, mm -hmm. climate change, and the economy. And those are the things that they're most concerned about. And that spans the, the spectrum. It's not just a, a progressive or conservative 
There's a lot of talk about how Gen Z might be the young generation that actually does do it, does get out there. There's a lot of excitement, especially after the Parkland shooting. There's a lot of thought that yeah. current high schoolers might be the ones to really turn up in 2020. Yeah. Um, tell me about some of the barriers that you come across working with specifically young people, trying to get young people sure. activated. And weren't they inspiring, the Parkland oh, yeah. students? Sure. Very inspiring. So a uh, couple of issues. So you have where it's not an equitable landscape. So folks in an urban landscape are not necessarily off, able to participate as well as maybe some in the suburban. And then you have issues in, in rural areas as well. So we call these civic deserts where they don't have opportunities to participate. They don't have, our, op, they don't have libraries. They don't have, they, don't have, they don't have opportunities where they can, partic they, they can donate their time and, and volunteer. It's just, so th all those things push people towards a larger civic engagement. And also then you have um, folks who have access to digital broadband, which also encourages and increases your ability to be digitally and, and, and civically engaged. Sure. So not everybody, I, I think we're at a point where 60% of folks in this country have access, whereas 40% do not. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Do, is anyone in this room under 18? Anybody in our 18 year olds? I thought I would ask. Does <laughs> Okay, yeah, you are the future voters, you count here. Does anyone have a child under 18 in this room? DC, can you tell people how to get involved? I don't know if you ask people to sign their children up or if you ask teenagers to sign up directly. Tell, tell us how this works. So 22by20.org, which you see on the screen, is a place where we're not only featuring our fellows, but in fact, our fellows submit the media that they create through the website. So they're creating memes, GIFs, videos. Classic, classic teenage uh, speak. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and last, last uh, January, we had uh, several State of the Union action parties around the country where we were getting young people excited about being aware of the State of the Union, but also interacting with it and not just saying, oh, this is nothing important to us. So they were, they were annotating the State of the Union text. They were creating videos about issues that, were, that matter to them. Mm -hmm. And we will continue to do that, and that's what our, our fellows will do. So go to 22 by 20 and sign up. Great. And there's a table. You have a table in that corner, right? We do. Over there. Great. Yeah. People will come meet you there. DC Vito, thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you. Next up, we have Julie Schwietert Colazzo from Immigrant Families Together. Come on up, Julie. Julie, start by just telling us what Immigrant Families Together does. Well, I have to start by saying that WMYC was actually responsible for Immigrant Families Together because it was after I heard a segment with Beth Furtick back in June in which she was interviewing um, a lawyer here in New York called Jose Horochena who was representing an immigrant mom who was affected by zero tolerance she was in detention in Eloy, Arizona, and her this kids were Yenny here. This was Jenny Gonzalez, yep. right? Jenny yep. Gonzalez Garcia, yeah. uh huh. Um, and her kids were here in New York. And when I heard that, I thought, this is our entry point where we can, um, my husband and I, can reach out to the people who say they're so angry about zero tolerance and say, let's all put our money um, where our mouths are and let's spring this woman out of detention. Let's get her here. Let's get her back with her kids. And let's also, most importantly, stick with her through the whole process because um, the folks that are in detention are not able to support themselves economically. So the plan was to do that once. Um, as of today, we've done that 53 times. We've raised a million dollars. And this is raising money for bond, right? To bond right. people out. So we've raised a million dollars, fully half of which has gone to the bonds for these 53 family members. And then the other half has almost entirely been spent on um, supporting the families. So um, in addition to these 53 families, we also picked up dozens of families after the family re reunification deadline at the end of July, and we continue to provide them with everything from legal um, counsel, medical support. I have to say here in New York, we have amazing pro bono partners, NYU Dental Clinic and Tribeca Pediatrics both see all of our families for free, so please support them. Um, and yeah, we just try to stick with them for the long haul. Julie, I'm asking you this because you're a fairly new group. As, mm -hmm. you, as you said, you just formed. <laughs> yep. um, do you have any tips or advice for other people who are new to the organizing game, trying to get something off the ground? Um, yeah, I think really to not sit around and wait until you have all the things that you think that you need to have in place. We didn't have money in place. Um, I'm a former social worker, but I didn't necessarily have experience running a group or organization. 
Um, I think it's just really about relying on your network of people and um, accepting who shows up to help and welcoming them and finding a place for them to be part of your, your effort. How can people here support you? So a lot of different ways. Um, you can go to immigrantfamiliestogether.com and you can go to our donate page if you want to donate money because supporting a number of families is not a cheap proposition. Um, but also, we welcome New York area volunteers. Um, we have uh, folks all over the country working. We've um, relocated families everywhere from California to Texas and Florida, Des Moines, Iowa. We really have folks all over the country. Are you um, looking for people specifically with an expertise in immigration law or anything? No, or? not at all. Okay. Um, the mayor's office, I have to say, has been amazing about providing pro bono counsel to all of the families that we have here. So we're really looking for anybody who wants to just be involved with a family, helping out, going to appointments. Um, yeah, anything. If you're a realtor and you have housing or a, a property owner and you have housing, I would love to talk to you. <laughs> Find Julie. She's Find in the back. <laughs> she has this table in the back. Thank you so yeah, much. Sure, thank you. Appreciate it. Are we having fun yet? Remember, you don't need to choose just one at the end. It's great. <laughs> Next up, Reverend Dexter Henderson. Come on up, please, to tell us about East Brooklyn congregations. Hello, Reverend. Hello, how Thanks are you? Thanks for joining us. I'm good. I, I know me. that East Brooklyn Congregations covers a, a whole gamut of issues. Yes. Um, tell me about some of the most recent victories that you, you have accomplished. Oh, absolutely. Well, East Brooklyn Congregations uh, is uh, a part of Metro IAF, uh, Metro Areas Foundation. And what we have been doing over the past 40 years is advocating for affordable housing throughout this city. And for the past three years, we had challenged the mayor to stand by his promise uh, of ending the tale of two cities. And so we put forth a plan and we uh, put forth a plan. We went to the mayor and we asked for $500 million to be put into the city budget uh, for 100% um, uh, affordable senior housing. We're looking for 15,000 units to be built. Um, also, uh, we were part of the lawsuit that led to the decision for $2.2 .2 billion to be uh, added to this budget as well for NYCHA repairs. Mm -hmm. And so we were able to, yes, we, we, and now mind you, for three years we went to the mayor and he refused to meet with us. And so what we did in response is that we brought 6,000 people to City Hall last year on Columbus Day in a torrential rainstorm and there were more people at the rally in the rain than there were at the Columbus Day Parade. And so there is power in people. So tell me how yes. these people can power your organization. Oh, absolutely. But what we do at EBC, and if you have organizations that are looking to empower people, one of the things that we've done is we don't go into areas like we're missionaries. We, we want people to, to fight for themselves. Okay, so what we've done is we go house to house. We do one-on-ones, thousands of one-on-one -on -one meetings, house meetings where we try to identify leaders and because there are always somebody in the community that has people following them. When we identify those leaders, we, ha we have them have house meetings. They invite their neighbors. Those neighbors get empowered. And then we come together. We train them, teach them how to lead, and then we go on actions and for every action, whether it be speed bumps or stop signs, whatever that action may be, no matter how small, we evaluate, we learn from those actions, and we continue to train and continue to find leaders to help uh, make change. So if there are people in this room or who are listening to the live stream right now yes. who uh, have an issue on their mind that they want to try and get addressed, they can bring it to you? Is that something that, how does the process work? Well, what we do is we, we understand that there are there were big things like racism and things of that nature, right? And so, but we, what, what we do is we narrow them down to issues. And so once we find an issue, then we, we need the people who are most affected by that issue to fight for it. Mm -hmm. You see, it is, it is not empowering for us to go in and, 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 and put a Band-Aid on your situation and then leave and you're powerless again. And so what we do is we, we teach them how to lead themselves. What should people do to reach out to you? They um, well, they touch. can they can reach us uh, reach us through Metro IAF um, Metro Areas Found uh, Metro Industrial Areas Foundation. Um, you can just Google us. Um, you can see the work we've done. We've been instrumental in building affordable housing in the city since the 1980s. The first Nehemiah houses, um, and 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 I will say this. I will have to say that we did get after we brought 6,000 people to City Hall um, on June 12th of this year. Um, Council Speaker uh, Corey Johnson met with us on the steps of City Hall and Mayor de Blasio came out and endorsed it and $500 million was put into this year's city budget uh, for um, affordable senior housing as well as the $2.2 .2 billion for NYCHA repairs. Now, the reason I'm here tonight is also because that 
despite the fact that the money is in the pipeline, we know that money in the pipeline is not a shovel in the ground. And so we're here to continue to challenge the mayor to continue to put his money where his mouth is and to continue to keep his promise as the mayor of this city. As he continues to proclaim himself as the most progressive mayor in the nation, we want him to prove that by providing affordable housing. You have more folks with you tonight from East Brooklyn congregations, right? Yes, we have a hands? couple of our leaders with us You're tonight. You're here in the room. Yes, and these if are leaders. If you'd like to find any of them afterwards, yes. please come and speak to them. Yes, indeed. Reverend Henderson, thank, thank you so you much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next up, we have Josh Lerner coming up to talk about participatory budgeting. Come on up, Josh. If you could start by giving everyone just a quick lesson on what participatory budgeting is. Of course. So it's, it's a way hard for to say. it is. I say PB. So if I say PB, PB. I'm talking about okay. peanut butter, participatory budgeting. <laughs> but it's a way for you to decide how to spend your tax dollars. The short answer. And so it's a process in which ordinary community members like you and me directly decided to spend part of a public budget. This isn't an abstract idea. This is actually happening in around 7,000 cities around the world, including New York, which I can talk about. Mm -hmm. And the way it works is that you take part of the government budget and you ask folks for ideas on how to spend it, how to improve your schools, your streets, your parks. And then volunteers turn those ideas into real projects with price tags that have been vetted by city agencies. They bring them back to the public for a vote on a ballot. You vote and decide on the top projects. The ones with the most votes get funded and then get implemented. And so this is a way for you to actually make real decisions beyond electing someone to decide for you, but to decide what government does. So right now, the way that it works is that your city council member has to opt in, right? So that your city council district gets to end up voting on these options, yeah, this, right? Yeah, this works in lots of ways, actually. So this works in schools, in cities. Actually, nations have done participatory budgeting. Any kind of budget has tried this somewhere around the world. And actually, in New York, uh, people as young as five years old are able to vote in participatory budgeting. Did you hear that, young kids in the room? Yep. You can vote in participatory so budgeting. In some of the schools that do participatory budgeting, actually, my son's school, we do it there. It's really fun if any of you have kids in school. Josh, why do participatory budgeting? I know the, the obvious answer is so that everyone has a say. But really, logistically, how does this, how does this work? How does this benefit us all? Yeah, so one, it's a great way to involve new people in government because it's so inclusive. Non-citizens can vote, people who, who are younger can vote, folks who normally don't participate, and we see that that's who tends to show up. If you say money's on the table, people want to come out and they want to participate. And so then they get more involved, they vote more often after this, they get involved in city council, in the government more broadly. It's also a way to take democracy beyond elections and beyond just voting for someone to decide for us, but democracy can mean more than that. And this is a demonstration that we can decide how our city looks, how government money gets spent. So it's not yet time to vote, but are you still in the idea collection phase of your budgeting process? There's, there's time for some ideas. Right now, folks are turning ideas into projects, and there'll be a vote in late March, early April. And so if you live in one of the participating districts, then you'll be able to vote in your district to decide to spend at least a million dollars. Is there anything that folks can do right now as they're listening? There's a few things. So this is kind of unique. So actually tomorrow, you will be able to vote not just in democracy, but also for democracy. So there's three ballot measures that you all can vote on tomorrow, all of which I would encourage you to vote for. They're all great for democracy and civic engagement. Um, so the second one is to create a civic engagement commission. And one of its main tasks would be to make city, um, city-wide participatory budgeting. So it wouldn't just be in some council districts, it'd be across the city. There'd be more money for it, more staff support. This would address a lot of the challenges folks face, actually, when there isn't city support for it. And so this is a big step to bring New York up to par with cities like Paris and Madrid, where this is a citywide program. So we really encourage folks to vote for that. Uh, and then also, you can do this, again, in your school, uh, in your children's schools, in your neighborhoods, in your city council districts. There's lots of ways for you to engage. Josh Turner, thank you so much. Appreciate okay. it. Josh Lerner, appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, if you want to know more about your ballot questions, go to WNYC.org. You'll know what's on the second side of your ballot tomorrow. Uh, next up, we have someone from Future Now, Daniel Squadron. Come on up and tell us. Hello. Hi, Daniel. How are you? Take a, take a walk downstage okay. with me, won't you? Tell us about Future Now. I fall now. off the stage. No, no, not all the way. No, no. Okay. Uh, what is Future Now, and why is it now? It's now. It's always now. It's the always future. now. That's right. But Very really, it's, it's really important, because for people who feel, and I know this is a great season for it, who feel despondent, worried, angry about what's happening in politics. That's one way to put it. And, a great season for despondency, folks. And, and for the solution. It's a great season for a solution. And also frustrated by how much impact you can have. Uh, there is an answer. Now, it starts with voting. We talked about that. I hope everyone here and across the country votes tomorrow. 
I think we're going to have historic turnout. But it doesn't end there. In fact, just voting is not the same thing as fully fulfilling your civic duty. And so we have an answer for that. And it's very exciting and glamorous. And it's called state legislatures. <laughs> because the truth is, regular people can have an outsized impact in fixing our country by making state legislatures better. And Future Now and Future Now Fund are all about empowering people to do that. Right, so you're looking at state races versus, say, like federal seats, congressional seats. That's the idea? State legislatures around the country. We have uh, two chambers here in New York, two chambers in every country, uh, state in the country except Nebraska. And they have been largely ignored except by a narrow band of special interests with a vested interest in the outcome. Basically a profit-based one because state governments have so much power. In fact, state governments control our schools, our transit, they control whether the water is safe to drink, mm -hmm. they control voting rights with the Trump court fu fully in place for a generation, unfortunately. They are gonna be the number one check on that. So they have an enormous impact in our lives and impacting them yourself it costs a fraction what it does a congressional race. For example, flipping an entire legislative chamber often costs less than a single competitive congressional district and has an outsized impact. Mm -hmm. So you're talking about flipping chambers. How do regular people get in on this? Right, so it's hard, right? 50 states, 50 different campaign finance laws, 50 different political dynamics. That's where Future Now and Future Now Fund come in. We do all the work to make it easy, and then we have something called giving circles. In fact, some of our giving circle steering committee are here tonight from a group called and Downtown have, Nasty Women. I met them before. And, I did a story about them. And they They're have raised. Fired up. They have raised together over hundred thousand dollars to impact the Michigan House election tomorrow. The way it works, it's an amazing thing. So these are, these are they're fundraising groups that you're encouraging people to make. You know, they start with fundraising, but they really become communities that become activated about why it is state legislatures are so important and how that's a window into changing our democracy from the ground up. So they come together and make it very easy at our website and raise dollars, gain expertise, choose which state their dollars will impact dollar for dollar. And in fact, we've had a lot of them. I think that downtown nasty women have postcarded, called, and texted. We had a field trip out to Michigan this past week. It becomes a real community exercise around civic engagement and changing our politics. So Daniel, real quick, 30 seconds. How can people here get involved? The election is tomorrow. What happens next? How is Future right. Now part of it? Well, you could do the shortest giving circle in history between now and 8 a.m. tomorrow, and we would love to see you do that. But even better, uh, we make it really easy to set up on our website. It's futurenow.org. You set a goal. You can write your own description, name yourself, get your uh, friends and family engaged. We really want folks to do it. And if you have more questions, come over to the table, because it really really is the best way to have the biggest impact to actually fix our country. What's the next election you're setting your sights on for these new, newly formed giving circles that will form in this 2019 tournament? and 2020, we want to be in more than a dozen states around the country having a big impact for regular people who just care about a better country. Daniel, thank you so much. Daniel thank Squadron, you. Future Now, thank their you. table is right over there. Next up, refugees welcome to dinner. We have Gisu Nia coming up. Hi, Gisu. Gisu, start with telling us what happens. What is this? Refugees welcome to dinner. There's dinner involved. You have aprons on your table. We what do. is this event about? Um, so basically, we wanted to host dinners, whereby we bring together newcomers and locals to share a meal and get to know more about one another. So how does this work? Does someone reach out to you if they have a group of non-refugees and they say, we'd love to welcome someone to our table? Or yeah. Logistically, how do people get so this So when together? we started, we thought that we'd have universities, organizations, um, houses of worship host. And we launched in February 2017. It just happened to coincide with the time of the Trump travel just ban. weeks after, right? Indeed, yeah. that was not intentional. And because of that, a lot of companies signed up to host. They were super angry, I think, and just wanted to demonstrate that they did not um, stand for those values and they stood for different values. So people get in touch with us through our website um, and we've now organized um, more than 150 dinners in five countries. So it's grown quite a lot, but anybody can host. You can go to the website, download the toolkit, super easy, and we hope that more people do it. What happens at dinner? It is there an, is there like a program in place yeah. or it really depends um i had been to dinners in the past where there was maybe like one refugee family 
and everybody was sort of around the table, maybe like 50 people, and just asking them about their story, and it felt very intrusive. And so what we wanted to do is create really a social moment. So it's more about um, the guests are evenly split. It's about 40 to 50 people in total. Um, half of the folks are newcomers, and they come from everywhere. They're refugees and asylum seekers. Um, and then the other half are with the company, are part of their network. And so um, a lot of times the conversations can range from like, you know, how are your kids? Isn't it tough to deal with raising teenagers? To what are your favorite recipes? Because food is such a central part of the programming. And then sometimes there is that discussion of the deeper things, of why these folks are here, the journeys that they've been on, and the ways that people who are um, the locals can relate, because a lot of them have also come here, maybe years ago, but they can share those stories. How can people find out more? How can people try and facilitate a dinner if they're interested yeah. in doing that? They can visit refugeeswelcometodinner.com. Welcome to dinner. There's a two in there. Welcome, Welcome to, to dinner. dinner. Yeah, T-O. And then also, um, Shanna and Lindsay are back there at our table giving out aprons and offering a sign-up sheet. Thank you so much. Yeah, Gisu Nia with Refugees Welcome to Dinner. Find them at that back table. Next up... The folks from Good Call New York. We have Gabriel Leader Rose and Jelani Anglin. Come on up, folks. There's only a few more left. Actually, there's only two more left. Hi, welcome. How are you? Welcome, welcome. I'm great. How are you? Good, Thanks good. for coming. Tell us what Good Call New York does. What kind of services you provide? So Good Call is a completely free hotline in the event of arrests. In the event anybody gets arrested, you could call our hotline 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and connect with an attorney completely for free in all five boroughs of New York City. Okay. Thank you. Tell us a little bit more about the services that are provided when people make this call. So right now, uh, when folks are arrested today in New York City, uh, they only have about five minutes to speak to an attorney who's then going to actually fight for their freedom. And that's not enough time. So with good call you're actually able to connect with an attorney at the point of arrest when you're in a precinct. That attorney is gonna be able to invoke your rights, tell the police not to question you until you have a lawyer present, but then also provide you with information. And we also paired this with a web component where you can save emergency contacts, and on that same call where you're speaking to an attorney, you could actually send text messages to your loved ones, let them know of the arrest. So it sounds like this service, you're, there's a lot that you're providing to people, but it really hinges on whether people know about it, right? right. People in that situation need to have already known about this. How, what, are, what are the things that you do to make sure that word gets out, that people know this is available to them? So we have, uh, we're doing outreach all over New York City. We have uh, an outreach team made up of folks that have been involved within the system understand the situations, understand the socioeconomic problems that happen in our communities, but then also working with CBOs that are spreading the information. Um, we're also creating swag, hold on. <laughs> it's a costume change, we got your back. There it is. Can you say the number for those listening? Also that we have people live streaming in, they may not have Here. seen your shirt. Eight, triple three, good call. Eight, triple three, good call. Okay, perfect. Anything else that people in this room can do to support your efforts? Yeah, um, so we have ways that folks can actually volunteer. We're gonna be putting out uh, the community part of our site later on this week. You can actually go and volunteer to do outreach within your communities. It's really important that we are all organizers and we're trying to make change. Uh, they say that the strongest form of consent is silence. And there's things that are happening in our country right now. And as folks that are, may not be uh, directly involved with proximity, you still have power to change it on a higher scale. So making sure that we all utilize our networks to speak out about what's happening within our communities uh, and then pay attention to the issues and vote, vote, vote. <laughs> How can people sign up? Is there an email or a website that they can go to? Yeah, so you can go to goodcall.nyc and that community part where you can actually volunteer will be live later on this week. But you can always uh, email community at goodcall. Uh, within the near future. Well, you can do that now. Yeah. Uh, email community at Good Call now to share that information. Great, and do you have a table? We don't have a table, but They're we roaming, have- They're roaming, so Malik. find them. Where's Malik? We have our engagement coordinator, Malik Reeves here. Raise Gabe your hand. And myself. Let people know uh, where you are. They're <laughs> live uh, streaming right now, I'm assuming, with their yeah. phone up. So we can uh, connect that way, you can find us. We'll be around. Okay, find out more after, after this, when we all mingle. Thank you so much, <laughs> Jelani and Gabriel. Thank you, you can hand it to uh, Ricardo over there, yep. Our last person in our roulette is Giselle Ruther, Coalition for the Homeless. Come on up, come on up, Giselle. Giselle, 
your group is the nation's oldest advocacy organization helping homeless men, women, and children. Yes. Tell me a little bit about what you do here in New York. Let, let's take a walk down here so people can sure. see us too. Tell us about what your work here. Yeah, so we've been around since 1981. Uh, we actually run 11 direct service programs where we're trying to meet the daily needs of people who are homeless in New York City. Uh, so that includes a mobile soup kitchen, job training program, a drop-in crisis intervention uh, program where folks can come in without an appointment any day of the week. So we try to meet people's needs where they are. Uh, uh, but one of the most important things we do is advocacy as well. And so what we're constantly pushing for is more affordable housing in New York City, specifically for homeless New Yorkers, um, so that we can actually reduce record homelessness that we've been facing for many years now. Tell me a little bit about some of the, the barriers to success when you're working with and for homeless people. Um, tell me about some of the walls that you find yourself kind of hitting again and again and how to over how you found you've overcome them Yeah, I think some of the toughest things are the structural barriers that are, exist um, In how we provide housing in New York City. There's no right to housing unfortunately uh, Here in the US and here in New York City And so we're constantly fighting for pieces of the pie and making sure that we're actually meeting the needs of all New Yorkers here in New York Anything that people can do if they want to know more, if they want to sign up, yes. or if they want to help, is there a way that people can get involved? Yeah, so the, a bunch of different ways people can get involved. The coalition for the homeless .org, we have a lot of volunteer opportunities, uh, both with our direct service programs, but I also really want to talk about um, an awesome advocacy campaign that we're working on right now, which is called the How's Our Future campaign, and we've um, really been pushing the mayor now to dedicate a greater portion of his housing, uh, affordable housing plan, specifically for homeless New Yorkers. Uh, so we're looking at 10% of his housing housing plan with 24,000 units new construction specifically for homeless New Yorkers. It's something that's gaining a lot of traction in the past, just in the past few weeks. Um, and so again, if you go to coalitionforthehomeless.org, there is a link right on the homepage to that campaign. We've got 60 other organizations involved and the majority of elected officials in New York City also on board besides the mayor. And so it's not just about voting, it's about holding your elected officials accountable to, uh, to the values that you hold. And so that's something that we're really pushing for. Is there any particular skill set in volunteers that your organization finds very helpful? Um, I, we can take a wide variety of volunteers. It sort of depends. You know, since we have so many programs, we have folks that come out and help hand out meals um, at our mobile soup kitchen. Uh, for someone that wants to get involved more regularly, you can help with our shelter monitoring. We actually have a unique role in New York City where we are the independent monitors of the shelter system and can go out and check on folks and make sure things are operating the way they should be uh, according to city law. And so there's a bunch of different ways you can get involved in uh, depending on kind of what you're interested in your time. You know, every winter I feel like WNYC fields a lot of questions from listeners about how to help homeless people. Um, so hopefully those people who have these questions can come and find you at your Absolutely. table at the end of the evening. You're in this back corner, in right? In the corner, yep. In the back corner. Giselle, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, and that concludes the fast-paced roulette portion of the evening. I hope that you have time afterwards. Stick, stick around, mingle, talk to the people that you're interested in finding out more about, and hopefully this gave you some ideas for how you can engage more and create change in your community. Thank you. Yasmin's coming up. Hey. Tag teaming. Thank you so much. Totally, I have mad respect for all the work that you're doing in the room. Um, we have another speaker. His name is Ben Yee, and he is the secretary of the Manhattan Democratic Party. He is also a state committeeman, and he is going to talk about politics. Sort of, not really. I call, I call Ben, come on up. I call Ben a civics evangelist, um, or someone I think once called you a traveling civics superhero. He knows, he knows stuff, and he's gonna give you, he's gonna give us some inspiration about what we can do between elections. Maybe, I mean, I do know stuff. I definitely know, you know stuff. You know a lot of stuff. Hey everybody, I'm Ben Yee. How's it going? I am here to talk to you about good old-fashioned politics. In particular, a win or lose tomorrow, what we can all do to stay engaged and get the things we want out of our government. So, a lot of that comes down to lobbying. Today, beyond midterms, five things you can really do to... Nope, that's wrong. I didn't even know my own slides. Five things you can do to really lobby. All right, now there's gonna be a lot of stuff here. I usually give talks that are like an hour plus. So we're gonna just blaze through this. If you have questions or any uh, comments after the fact, uh, that's my contact information. I always love hearing from folks, but here we go. This slide is just to demonstrate to you that I know what I'm talking about. I've been in politics for about 10 years, started on the Obama campaign as a fundraiser, and now I am the secretary of the Manhattan Democratic Party and a Democratic State Committeeman, as mentioned. But we won't dwell too much on that. First things first, how do we get what we want? Well, let's start with the thing we all know about, give money. 
But I want to drive this idea home that lobbying isn't really about how much you give, or at least it's not only about how much you give. A lot of it has to do with how you lobby. Money is money after all. Now I was a fundraiser for Barack Obama, and this is not to call out Obama in particular. All politicians are essentially the same because all politicians need money. When you have a lot of people giving a lot of cash to fund your campaign, their voice is dispersed. The real difference between lobbyists and small dollar donors is not the fact that you can't fund a campaign on small dollar donations. You absolutely can. The difference is that people give money, rich people get access for money. So the next time you decide to give a drip of $5 a month to the candidate you like, think again. Instead, save it up. Wait till you have a sizable portion, pay for a ticket to a fundraiser, and get that access. Make sure that when you give that money, the politician is there to receive it, and that you get in front of them and tell them what you care about and what you'd like. Now, I did say that it's not all about how much you give, but you should know that here in New York City, we have a matching funds program, which means that every dollar you give is matched six to one by the government. It could go up, actually, tomorrow if you vote for ballot proposition number one. But you should know that. If somebody was going to clap about that, you can clap. Uh, we, we're on a tight schedule here, but feel free to clap. All right, second, leverage institutions. Why leverage institutions? Because your money, your relationships, they're great. But institutions are organizations which amass relationships and money and people over time, and they have a lot to offer. Now, what are institutions? Well, there's two really popular ones, or maybe not popular, but famous ones that we all know about. If this thing, okay, there we go. And they are the Democratic and Republican parties. For some reason, the background of my slide changed, but do ignore that. The Democratic and Republican parties are two major institutions in our democracy. They obviously raise and spend buckets of money and have lots of important political relationships. But did you know that the Republican and Democratic parties are controlled by voters? When you vote in a primary, you also have the opportunity to elect party leadership. That's what it means when I say I'm the secretary of the Manhattan Democratic Party. I am an officer elected by voters to help run the party. When I am a Democratic state committeeman, I am an officer elected by Democratic Party voters to help run the Democratic Party. We make those decisions by voting on how the party spends its money and how it leverages its resources and who it supports. Oh, man. All those boxes are supposed to say elected in them. So just know that you elect these people who run the parties. And when you vote, vote in primaries, don't sleep on that. Now, there's another sort of institution that a lot of us are familiar with, unions. Unions are also an incredibly important and valuable institution in our democracy. Their leadership is also elected, but this time by union members. The idea here, or the goal here isn't to say, go join a union per se, it might not be available to you, but find the institutions and organizations and Democratic or Republican clubs in your area and join them, because they have resources which can be leveraged. And the establishment or the insiders, they're all elected. You can unelect them, you can replace them. Petition. I want to talk about petitioning just for a second. I know, I know, this is be beyond the midterms and between elections, and this happens at election time, but I want you to know about it. We didn't start with petitions in this country. We didn't start with primaries in this country. We didn't start with political parties. These were all inventions. Now, petitioning was a super important invention which makes signatures matter. This is as opposed to money or political connections. If you want to get on the ballot, you get signatures, you can run for office. Why is that important? It makes the race, all right? Politics is a zero-sum game. Only one person can win an election at a time. Usually, politicians go unopposed, either in a primary or in a general election. How did the Tea Party scare the Republicans all the way to the right? It wasn't because they had such wonderful conservative ideas that were well thought out and researched. That wasn't it. They petitioned, put people on the ballot, won a couple of fluke elections, and then every Republican politician had to worry about these people challenging them and taking away their nice seat and all of their power and money. Petitioning, it matters. Fourth, use useful metrics. Now I just want to say this, when you go and lobby, people will say, oh, tell your story of self. Use the metrics that explain how the legislation will impact people. Politicians care about two things. How will the legislation they're voting on change things for the constituents? And two, how is the person in front of them going to change their electoral future? And not necessarily in that order. But they have two questions, you should answer both of them.
And also, don't lie. Those stats that you are, uh, that you're bringing to them, the signatures that you gathered, the money you raised, how voters are turning out in their districts, that's all public information. That's what makes it powerful. They can just go back and check up on your work, and they'll decide for themselves, is this person somebody I should be listening to? If you don't satisfy these requirements, they'll just write you off. If you do, then they'll listen. And finally, focus. Now, there's two things to focus on. First, choose your issues. If you have 100 issues, do not go with 100 issues. <laughs> go with one or two issues. Do not worry, politics will not stop. When that legislative session is done, you can always go back. There's always more politics. And second, find the right politicians and focus on their districts, not on general support. If you're out there with a million voters across the country, that's a lot less than a million voters in the right district. And what makes the right district? Well, you should know, not all elected officials are created equal. There are some people who are much more important. If you are a committee chair, you kill bills. If you are the leader of a chamber, you kill bills. So that's Paul Ryan, Mitch McConnell, they kill bills. Committee chairs, killing bills. Your politician is really nice, I'm sure, and they love everything you say because that's their job. But it doesn't matter if you have all the votes in Congress if the two people who are on the committee and in leadership don't like it. Your bill will never see a vote regardless of how many people you have in support. And that is a short recap <laughs> of five things you can do to really lobby. If you want more on that, hit me up on the internet. Thank you so much. I'm just going to ask a quick follow-up question. So what I'm sure. getting from this is you, or it's not enough to walk into your elected officials' district office and talk to constituent services, and everybody always tells you to call your representative and that kind of thing. Well, you should definitely call your representative, but folks should, of course, recognize that not all politicians are on their side, but if your politician is on your side, telling them that over and over again won't necessarily change anything. You need to change people who are against you or on the fence in swing districts. And on constituent services, that's different from lobbying or legislation per se. Constituent services, if you have a problem uh, with, say, your trash or something else, some other sure. issue with the government, that's for resolving those sorts of issues. Okay, so for having sway, you need to follow this yes. system. Okay. Yes, right, the patented Benny system of lobbying in right. five minutes. <laughs> Um, so you and I have talked at length. You're like famous to us in the newsroom because you have explained political parties to us. Um, and we have talked at length about basically how untransparent political parties are, mm, the yeah. sort of county committees, how arcane the rules are. And I'm just, before you go, because since you have this room, I just want people to sort of have a window into how bananas this all is. And so can you just tell us, sure. since you've been on the Manhattan Democratic Party, uh, county committee, what has changed for the better since you got there? Give us a little window of a quick before and after. Well, just that you know, as long as I've been there for about 10 years and because of that, nothing has changed for the worse. It's all for the <laughs> okay, better. Right, I just right. want to start there. But uh, <laughs> things that have changed for the better. It's become a lot more transparent and open, certainly here in Manhattan. There are fights in all the other boroughs for the same, but we didn't have a website. Manhattan had the first website of a county party here in New York City. We live stream all our meetings now. What year now. did that happen? 2013. Okay. We got a website in 2013. Keep going. But it was good. It's, it's old now, but it was good. We're getting a new one. Um, we live stream all of our meetings. Uh, that's humongous. There's real transparency that you can see how your representatives are voting in the county party. Uh, we just rewrote essentially our entire rules at a meeting uh, last week. So people got involved. They did not like the way the rules were written. We created a rules committee by vote of the county committee and we ratified a bunch of the changes just last week, which it Sounds is, so radical. Oh. You voted, you created a committee and it worked. Democracy is a radical idea. I guess, guess that's true. And, and the point of, you once told me that the point of parties hmm. is that they were supposed to make the process more democratic. Well, the point of the committees the and the elected rather. committees was to make the process more democratic. They used to all be closed. You came up through the hierarchy. It was all patronage. The reformers, the progressives in the 1870s and the turn of the century in New York, uh, they made it so that all these people were elected. And the reason was people knew a closed party system was not democratic. They figured this out 150 years ago. The primaries we got from them, the county committees we got from them, the petitioning we got from them, those are all gifts that make our democracy work. And when people don't vote in primaries, they're like, oh, it's not a democracy, politicians don't listen. I'm like, 
yeah, if you don't vote in primaries, people figured that out two, you know, 150 years ago. Vote in your primaries, please, for the love of God. And vote for your party leadership and go to the county committee meetings. They, well, I'm not going to say they want to see you there, but I want to see you there. <laughs> Thank you so much, Ben Yee. My pleasure. Appreciate it. Thank you. We have just a moment now where everyone can just relax and enjoy some music. Um, closing Beyond the Vote, our event tonight, we have joining us violinist Emily Kalish and pianist Kyle Walker, and they can come on up. Um, they are members of the Dream Unfinished. Welcome. An activist orchestra, and TDU's mission is to use classical music to spark conversations on race and equity. So Emily and Kyle, thank you. Emily and Kyle will be performing a preview of TDU's 2019 season, uh, Deep River, which will focus on the intersection of climate and social justice. Their two selections are Deep River, composed by Samuel Coleridge Taylor and transcribed by Maude Powell, and then Troubled Water by Margaret Bonds. Thank you so much, enjoy.
another round of applause. Thank you, thank you. Yasmin, do you want to come on up? We have one more piece. Oh, Kyle, I'm sorry. Please take it away. Take it away. Thank you. 
That was the dream unfinished. Thank you all so much for coming tonight. I think this was nice. We drank a little. Yeah, I feel we learned better. a little. We got to end it with a stirring musical performance. Yeah. And the bar is still open. The bar is still open for another 15 minutes or so, right? Okay. Thank you, everyone, for watching. Thank you for coming out. Thank you to everyone watching at home on the live stream. P please feel free to move around the room, walk up to all the tables, find out more, and thanks again for coming. Good night, everyone. Happy Election Day. Vote tomorrow.